Good afternoon everybody. Hope everybody's doing well in this sun. Just a shame we can't get out on the bowling greens unfortunately, but I uh, hope you're all keeping safe and well. Um, welcome to the first live Q&A that I've done on Facebook. It's a bit of a learning curve, um, but I hope it's successful. I hope you get something out of it. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Um, enter your questions on the live feed down below in the comments. Um, and they should pop up here for me to answer. Okay, so let's get straight into some of the questions that um, were posed before we did this live Q&A um, through various forums. Um, I'm going to ask the first one, which was um, from Barry Emmanuel from Surrey. Um, and he's asked, can two players in a fours match use the same set of bowls? Well, yes, he can. They they can. The both players can use the same set of bowls in a fours. Obviously, they're playing with two each. Um, but there are some caveats to that. Clearly, the bowls have to be tested um, and legal first. Um, but if one of those bowls gets damaged for any reason, um, the whole set needs to be replaced. So that means both players will end up having to replace their bowls. So whilst you can do it, it does um, have its quirks if uh, one of the bowls does get damaged so just be aware of that as you go through there was another question that um was posed on the question of bowls page um and it related to um a bowl resting on a toucher in the ditch um, and it caused a bit of a uh, bit of questioning and a bit of debate which is uh, always right um but i thought i'd go through it with you um in a sort of pictorial format as I can't share my screen and um, so what you can see here is um, a bowl in the ditch touching the jack near enough um, and there is a bowl which I've labeled B which is resting on top of it now that bowl isn't a live bowl in terms of a toucher um, it hasn't touched the jack but it has been delivered and it's come to rest in that position um, bowl C is from the same team as A um, and that um, is obviously resting on the edge of the rink and is live still as well. And the question was, was um, the maroon bowl B live or dead? Well, A is a toucher um, and B is resting on that toucher, but it's still in contact with the rink. And so that bowl is still live. If it then falls in a ditch or gets knocked into the ditch, then it's dead and gets removed. Same as any other um, non-toucher that goes in the ditch. So I hope that clears that one up. It's always a, an interesting one. There was a lot of debates about um, the, the depth of the ditch. Um, a lot of questions about being surely the, the, the ditch is too shallow because how could you possibly have a bowl resting on another bowl? Well, in fact, you can actually have a jack um, in the ditch with a bowl resting on top of it as well. If you may not have seen um, a, a, a real shallow ditch in the UK. It's not very common in the UK, um, but the minimum depth ditch is 50 mil, which is roughly two inches. A jack is roughly two and a half inches. So there is a little bit of jack that sits above the surface of the um, green when it's in the ditch, in a minimum ditch. So it's quite possible for a bowl to, to rest on top of that jack. So I hope that's cleared that one up for you. Um, welcome to everybody. Charlotte's here. Stephen, welcome. Bernie, uh, Stephen, when Joss fires a bowl at 200 miles an hour hitting the jack, <laughs> which had a touching bowl behind it, and the jack splits in two halves, both halves of the jack are still within the field of play. Is the end declared a dead end? Well, the, the, the simple answer to that, <laughs> Joss is obviously uh, known for his firing. Um, the simple answer to that is if, if, if a jack splits, um, then it is dead. Um, but you, you're declaring the end dead straight away, um, replacing the jack and declaring the end dead. So, um, yeah, it's happened a few times. Um, I've been on the unfortunate end of one of them. Um, but, yeah, it, it can happen. But clearly, when the jack splits, it's not the biggest half gets a shot. It's not the, it's not the fragment that doesn't get the shot. Um, it, uh, the end is replayed with a new jack. So welcome everybody, Bernie, um, Charlotte, welcome. Um, add your questions on the post here. 
have we got? Dan blew it upside down, am I? I guess you mean the picture. Okay. Any other questions? Right, so Bernie um, posed a question early, earlier on. Um, a little bit about um, World or Commonwealth Games. Um, and she asked, what was my most um, memorable experience at World or Commonwealth Games level? Um, now, I've been extremely fortunate in um, attending now five consecutive Commonwealth Games. Um, I'm extremely lucky to have done that. Um, a lot of people say I'm very lucky to have done that as well. But um, uh, I'm extremely proud to have achieved that. Um, most memorable um, experience. Every one of them has been different. Um, right from Manchester 2002, which was clearly the first um, Commonwealth Games that I attended um, as an official. The most memorable experience from that Games was marking the men's gold medal match. Um, unfortunately, in Manchester, it was pouring with rain, but you can't win them all. Um, so that was an incredible experience. Um, extremely fortunate to have achieved that. Um, but I think the one that really stands out more than anything is um, Delhi in 2010. Um, it was it was an interesting games. Um, the 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 bit that stands out more than anything for me is the heat. Um, it was extremely hot out in the rinks, 45 degrees Celsius, pushing 50 on some days. Um, but it was it was extremely hot. And then in the evenings, when um, the sun dropped below the horizon, we had bugs coming out. All the, all the floodlights went on, um, and we had most incredible bugs um, just covered everything. Um, so that was interesting. We did actually have one situation with um, quite a large water beetle um, that decided to march across the rink and, and move the jack, and it just walked off with the jack. Um, they, they were pretty strong and um, pretty big and scary. Uh, so, so that was an interesting displacement uh, scenario um, coming on there. But like I said, every every one of the five games I've done um, have been an incredible, incredible experience um, and super proud to also be heading the ITOs going into Birmingham 2022. Um, so that's going to be a great experience as well, I'm sure. England will put on a fantastic display. Birmingham will put on a fantastic display at um, Victoria, Victoria Park in Leamington. Okay, Alex Duckworth, my old mate, has arrived. <laughs> He's announced his arrival. Welcome, Alex. Um, and I know Alex is, um, I've known him for years and years and years, um, an old stalwart from uh, um, Kent. Um, he used to do a lot of courses with Alex. Um, absolutely fantastic guy, and I know that he's going to really ask some taking questions probably today. So, if they're too hard, I'll ignore them, Alex. So, um, what have we got? Um, Stephen Warren, uh, good to see you. What about the one that grabbed you on the arm, Alex? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there were a few bugs that um, did. Uh, did have a nibble every now and again. Okay, let's do another question from um, this one just posed earlier from Adam Rickard. Um, Adam, I'm not sure if you're online yet, um, but welcome if you are. Adam um, has asked, when marking singles, what do you do if a player asks you to move to the back of the ring because your position is disturbing them? That's quite an interesting question because the marker is really at the head. Um, as the player's eyes, they're, they're, they're there to help, they're there to mark touches clearly. Um, and in, in, in games where the spectators, they, they may be asked to indicate um, the state of play in the head um, using lollipops. Um, so the, the marker's position in those situations is quite important. Um, we generally say, we're, we're training markers, we generally say around about um, one to two metres um, to one side of the jack, one to two meters stepping back. So you've got an easy step forward, an easy step sideways to mark touches and get to wherever you need. Now, in a situation where the player is disturbed by position, um, there's, there's a couple of things that can be done here. Um, the, the last resort is to have a, have a conversation with the player and say, look, you know, 
this is this is the position I need to work in as a marker. Um, what is it that's disturbing you? Um, that is kind of last resort. But there's things you can do, like if if you're standing at the head um, and you're standing on the side that he's actually playing, then just move to the other side. Um, and, and generally, you'll find that that deals with the problem. Hopefully, so I hope that, hope that helps, Adam. You know, clearly, we don't want to get into any um, disputes with the players because you're there to help them, um, and there's no no reason really to get to get into disputes with the players. So I hope that helps. Stephen, Stephen, is there a temperature at which point of play should be stopped? Um, well, we'll be lucky in England to get a, a temperature like that. Um, but yeah, if you're referring back to when I was talking about Delhi, um, in those situations, um, there, there sometimes is, uh, certainly in the Southern Hemisphere, in Australia, um, and, and South Africa, there are um, conditions of um, in the play uh, conditions of play um, that will give temperature um, recommendations. So, you know, you don't want to be out in in high temperatures of 40, 45 degrees. Um, I don't know what they are off the top of my head in terms of Australia, but you know they they are pretty warm. Um, clearly, we're not going to get in that situation in England um, very often. Um, I think actually most people would prefer to see a lower end temperature where you call the game off because it is pretty cold outside in um, May at the beginning of the season. So, yes, there is a temperature point in some countries, but not always. And, and certainly with the Commonwealth Games we in, in Delhi, um, that temperature didn't come into play. You know, we, we just carried on playing. It was a tough schedule. So I hope that helps. Hi, Sandra. Sandra McLeish, good to see you on here. I haven't seen you for ages. I hope you keep him well. Oh, she said, don't block the side pin. Yeah, clearly when you're marking, you don't want to be standing in in in, in the way of the side pin. She, she obviously knows I do that quite a lot. Um, <laughs> you don't want to be standing in the way of the uh, side boundary marker. Um, so if you are in, in the player's lane, then you, you probably need to move to the other side of the rink um, um, and not block their line. Um, she's she's obviously experienced me doing that quite a few times. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Stephen, actually, he was thinking about the world in South Africa 2017, got to 40. Okay, 40 41 before play was stopped. Yeah, um, that, that was clearly in their um, conditions of play, so um, it can happen. Mind you, it's nice out there today, so I don't think it's quite warm enough to um, call any games off, but then you know, we're all sitting at home at the moment. And again, uh, welcome to everybody that's uh, just joining us. Alan, hi, I'm great to see one of the top umpires of the last oh, Thank you, that's very kind of you. <laughs> yeah, Barry's question, Charlotte. Uh, yeah, you may have joined the feed a little bit late, but um, I did answer that one. Um, does he use his teammate's bowl? Okay, so, um, so Charlotte's describing a situation where... Um, you can bowl a, you can play a bowl by mistake, um, and there is a, what should we call it? We'll, we'll call it a legal cheat, essentially. Um, there is a legal cheat where you can actually bowl um, another bowl if you want to get a tighter line. Um, so, for example, if your bowls are pretty swingy and you know that you're not going to get around uh, a short bowl, um, it has been known for somebody to pick up the wrong bowl um, that's a bit tighter and deliver it. Um, and one of the little quirks with the laws there is that um, that that wrongly delivered bowl just gets simply replaced. Um, so there may be a little bit of work to do on on that particular law, um, but it's kind of a, a legal cheat, unfortunately. So um, watch out for that one. Okay. Any other question? Anything you want to know about? Um, my experiences in the past in, in terms of uh, the World Bowls Tour, portable rink, um, televised bowls, and just pop them down on the feed. Uh, anything you want to know about Commonwealth Games, what it's like to officiate that level, or if you're joining us for the first time and you're not a qualified umpire marker at the moment, um, feel free to ask any questions about um, how to start up and, uh, and what the process is for officiating. Okay, Dan, Dan Blewett, my uh, WBT colleague, good friend. Um, welcome, Dan. 
why do you think that players would rather conduct their own measures rather than call on the umpires who could no doubt clear up any doubt a lot quicker? Even at the um, world levels, we often see the players carrying out their own equipment. Uh, and yeah, it's um, it's an interesting question, Dan. Um, certainly, when you, um, and Dan's experience on World Games as well, um, and when you see some of the some hemisphere players and actually some of the, the, the home nation players um, trying to measure, uh, trying to stick a box measure in the gap, it's only four or five inches, um, and you're standing on the bank ready to go, it, it can get a little bit frustrating. Why do they do it? I don't know. Um, you, you could probably argue that they've had a bad experience, or um, you could also probably argue that they don't get exposed to officials as much as um, uh, other players and aren't used to calling on an official. They want to make their own um, judgment call, which is clearly within their own right to do. They, they can make their own um, decisions. Um, but it, it does get frustrating when you're standing there with a pair of calipers in your hand um, and they're trying to use a box measure in a small gap. Um, in certain tournaments um, where we've got markers, for example, um, we we may turn around as, as part of the tournament and say um, the markers won't do the measure. Um, they will just call the, the umpire straight off. Um, that is, is a couple of reasons for that. The main one is that it saves a lot of time, uh, especially in time games. Um, but clearly in those situations, you will often find that the, the players will measure um, themselves first. Um, and then if there, there's any doubt, then they will call the umpire up, um, even though they've got a marker in singles. So great question, Dan. Well, so, uh, Tom. Hello, Tom. Welcome, Tom. Um, Tom Weir. Um, what's my opinion on a timed match? Um, <laughs> yeah, interesting one. Um, clearly now, um, majority of games, um, even even down to domestic level, are becoming um, timed. Certainly indoors, uh, certainly within within England, um, there is a time limit on on games. Um, but then when you get to the higher level, you know, things like World Championships, Atlantic Championships, Pacific Championships, um, we're all now playing to a time limit. Um, and some of those time limits are tight. Um, there is a calculation we do um, when we're writing the conditions of play based on generally on green speed. So um, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, those game times will be slightly longer than they are in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but my opinion of them um, is mixed. I think um, the shorter format um, has to happen. The, sh the shorter format of bowls really um, needs to happen to draw in spectators. It's not a great spectator. Um, sport when you're sitting there for four or five hours um, watching people walking up and down the rink and very few bowls being delivered. Um, so shorter, sharper games are um, are really needed for that sort of thing. The other side of the, the corner, of course, is if you've got a tight schedule, you're working um, you're, you're working a schedule that's running um, probably ten hours during the day. Um, if you get one of those games overlap uh, overrunning. And then schedules completely messed up. Um, so games have their place, um, and I think um, my opinion of them is that they they really do need to happen um, in order to keep shows going, in order to attract um, spectators. Hope that helps, Tom. Clearly, you know all about the time games. Hour and a half limits on the well, not hour and a half limits, but certainly um, uh, numbers of ends on um, WBT matches, which are quite easy to time. You know, generally, with World Bowls Tour matches um, on the portable rink, we can get a, um, a match through in an hour and a half, quite easily, 90 minutes. Charlie. Hello, Charlie. Charlie Murphy from Surrey. Have got to roll up at Potter's? Have I got to roll up at Potter's? Um, or have you? Um, I have. Um, we uh, do get the odd occasion to have a few up the rink and actually that's about the only bowls i play now um as most people that i play with will tell you um so yes i do get a chance to play on the football rink it's not an easy rink to play on um but we we do have a uh, a bit of a backup and um we do have a few challenge matches as well with bbc or the media crew um we'll have an evening where we um have a bit of a challenge match so that's always good fun 
Dale Spring. Welcome, Dale. Um, if a jack goes off the rink and has to go on a respot with a bowl on it, where is the, where is the jack placed? Okay, interesting question, that one, Dale, because that really depends on um, the conditions of play that you're working to. Um, if you're if you're familiar with the uh, World Bowls Tour format of play, um, that is slightly different to um, the World, Bo World Bowls Kristen Mark Laws um, uh, uh, version. So um, I'll give you both. Basically, in the law book, the one we work to pretty much um, all over the world, um, the, if a bowl is covering the respot, then the jack is placed um, in front of um, that bowl that's blocking the respot in the direct line with the opposite end of the rink. Um, in WBT, on the portable rink, it's slightly different in that it's placed to the side of the bowl towards the centre line in a direct line to the um, spot on the other side of the ring um, and of course the, the jack does touch up so you leave a little gap um, so I hope that helps Dale clear that one up yes Charlie um, yes I did I do get a chance to play a roll up on the uh, <laughs> portable ring Stephen can I see formats like extreme bowls or ultimate bowls games being played at nationals ah, interesting interesting question there um ubc ultimate bowls championships in australia are really taking the um uh, televised uh, bowls world by storm um and you know we're lucky enough to see that over in in the uk now um and across the world it's streamed um and it's a fantastic format um there's no two ways about it and as tom was saying you know timed games are uh, what's my opinion of time games i think that that ubc format is is the ultimate <laughs> it's in the name it's the ultimate format for um uh, really quick fast punchy games um that are audience friendly um it would be nice if we could get those uh, those tournaments over in the uh, in the uk um the question whether they would extend to um nationals possibly one day i don't see why they shouldn't um I think nationals, national championships, both indoor and outdoor, um, pretty much in all all countries in the UK, um, are a long long spell. You know, they're, they're long games. They're, they're sometimes timed, certainly indoors, um, but they are long games. And you know, maybe that short, sharp, punchy format might be of a benefit to um, the national championships. Jamie, Jamie Campbell, welcome. Um, how does an umpire get invited to international grade? Yeah, great question. Um, so, depending on which country you're in, um, it's important to understand that the, you know countries and, and the routes to different grades of official are different. Um, but if we're going to, we'll talk about England, I, I guess, because um, that's um, where I'm from, and that's the, the form I'm uh, the, the development program I'm most used to. Um, but it, it may be similar in other countries. So you're, you're starting off as a basic umpire, um, whether it be at club level or, or regional level, um, and generally then you're you're doing some sort of upgrade process um, to become a national level. Um, uh, and in some countries, if, once you become an umpire, you are qualified as an umpire at whatever level um, the games are. And, and, and certainly in some other countries where you're being assessed whilst you're working, um, that may dictate how you progress and what sort of games you get. So, um, once you, you generally get a, a fair decent amount of experience, um, that's when um, the view to becoming international is um, is quite important. So, in England, the route is by selection. So, if there's any international tournaments going on um, within England, um, then you're likely to be selected generally by recommendation um, from uh, regional coordinators, regional secretaries, um, but the, it's it's by selection only. There's no qualification um, in England, especially for an international grade official. There is one slight change to that in terms of um, world level, um, in that uh, the World Bowls Limited, the, the governing body for, for bowls, and have an ITO program. An ITO is an international technical official, um, and they have a program for that, which is by qualification. Um, and anybody can apply for that with, with the relevant experience. 
Um, there is an accreditation process, um, which includes a theory, practical, and um, if you're successful in that, then you become uh, an IDO um, under the World Bowls banner. Um, and for that, you will be um, potentially selected for the World Championships um, outdoor and um, the Commonwealth Games. Um, so there, there is a couple of routes of progress. Um, as I said, countries differ. Um, so speak to who are, um, your local umpiring body is to see what level you can achieve and how you do it. Okay. Uh, Sting bribery. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't do any of that bribery stuff. <laughs> okay. Anto Gray. Welcome, Anto. What do you think of the jumping and running after a good shot? Uh, you're in Dublin. Welcome, um, Anto from Dublin. Um, what I think of jumping and uh, running, um, yeah, mixed mixed views about um, uh, running up the green. I mean, it's it's always one of those little bones of contention with um, many clubs. You see the signs up on the club wall saying no running. Um, my view: uh, the more exuberant a player is, uh, the more they're enjoying their the game, the better. And actually, um, for me, it creates a good atmosphere. Um, it's exciting, you know, for playing good shots and it's a good match. There is no reason why um, people should be running, jumping, but with care. And I think the, the, the key thing there is with care. Clearly on a wet outdoor rink, um, not only is there the danger of damaging the rink, um, by jumping more than anything, um, but there's also the danger of slipping um, and, and falling. So um, the, there is your own safety to take care of when you're leaping around like a madman. Um, but you know, generally, from an atmosphere point of view, I, I, I enjoy a game where you've got that level of excitement. Um, so certainly encourage that. Hope that helps, Anto, and welcome to Dublin. Dale? Uh, do you think all bowls clubs should allow shorts now and get rid of the times? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so should umpires. <laughs> you know, we're, we're standing out in the heat as well. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, shorts are the way to go. Now, clearly not everybody's legs are up to it, mine included. But um, I think uh, shorts are definitely the way to go. Be comfortable when you're playing. Um, we're seeing now at um, even the domestic level, people wearing tracksuit kind of um uh, kit um and it's you know it's what we need to encourage people to join the sport so this this is the days really of um shirts ties um whites um they have their place in some scenarios but actually we need to move this going forward um and it is gradually happening um shorts definitely i would love to see people wearing shorts on the rink dan dan mcmanus welcome which rule would you change if you had completely free choice? <laughs> oh, wow, um, a tricky one. Um, uh, some of you may be aware that I'm on the uh, the World Bowls Laws Committee, um, and, and by the way, any views or, or laws I'm talking about today are my views, not uh, the Laws Committee's views. Um, but some of you are aware that I'm on the, the, the World Bowls Laws Committee, which look at um, questions that are coming in from around the world, um, but also look reviewing the laws as and when. Um, is deemed uh, necessary and certainly over the last six seven years there's not been really any contentious uh, laws that that really need changing i think the important thing is is to get to the cross of what the intent of the law is and that's more of what the laws committee are now doing is is thinking about um, a question that comes in um and describing what the intent of that intent of that law is as it's written um and, and really things shouldn't just be read in black and white they should be applied um to the game um so answer your question any law that i would like to see changed i think the one that causes the most controversy and the one that is really difficult to enforce is foot faulting and that's that's always been um the case the the law has been changed it's been meddled with a few times um but i still don't think we're there um so I think that one is, is is the one that constantly gets gets thought about, constantly gets looked at. Um, but 
try to find an answer to that question is is a different matter. And then I can I can assure you the members of the Laws Committee do look at that quite frequently um, uh, as questions come in. And you may have, um, if if you're interested in in what's happening um, with uh, the Laws Committee and what decisions they're made, um, uh, they're making, um, you can go onto the worldbowls.com website um, and have a look at the umpiring decisions. Um, uh, the Laws Committee decisions, as which are answering questions that come in from governing bodies. So, take a look at that, and you you may see what we're we're up to. Okay, shoes. Yes, um, Dale, Charlotte, Dan, uh, shoes. Um, Multicoloured shoes certainly becoming more popular. Um, certainly encouraging that. Um, I, I think. Um, I think. It, Nowadays, at the international level, is, is looking really smart. So, shoes clearly need to be compliant, um, and we we are seeing some shoe manufacturers pushing the boundaries a little bit with some of the um, some of the soles. Um, but generally, as long as they're flat, um, we didn't got a situation in in uh, some countries where they're actually defining what is a permissible shoe, um, using examples, so photographs of shoes, um, and they'll look at those at um, at the start of tournaments, um, just like you know, um, so colored shoes, absolutely, as long as they're compliant. Barry, welcome, Barry. Hope you all have you ever seen a spectator or player get injured by a jap following a heavy drive? Um, not personally, but I am aware of um, players and, and officials being hit by jacks. Um, there's been a few near misses, um, I've had a few near misses on the board rink as well. Um, but you know, I am aware that uh, people do, do happen to get in the way. Um, it's it's part of part parcel of uh, keeping safe on the rink. Um, uh, people notifying you when you're going when they're going to drive. Um, certainly indoors, um, it's more dangerous indoors. And just be aware of your surroundings on on uh, neighbouring rinks. Um, certainly, as a marker, um, you're in a bit of a dangerous position standing up there waiting for things towards you. But a marker. Um, is trained to move for, forward of the head um, when somebody's driving to avoid any injuries. So thanks for that, Barry. Supposing a firing shot is coming down the and the marker umpires momentarily distracted and misses the ball rubbing in the head and crucially, whether it hit the jack or not. Yeah, um, that's interesting why there's a bit more to that question. Let me just expand that. Yeah, that's the second question. Okay, so um, yeah, losing, losing concentration and, and missing touches and things, it's, you know, it can happen. Um, uh, but you know, if if a mark in the right position, um, forward of the head and just concentrating on that bowl and ignoring everything else that's going on around, um, then it should be possible to um, uh, distinguish a toucher. Um, there are the odd occasion where things are moving so fast, it's very difficult to see. With rebounding bowls and things, but you know it's it should be possible. Remaining with full concentration is obviously key to any of that. Um, so, as as an official, if you're on the rink, you really need to be concentrating all the time. Um, but certainly, as players in um, in team games, then uh, sometimes you need to be aware of displacement laws and and what would happen if if a bowl hit their foot um, or for example so um just be aware of um, displacement going on keep safe is the key it appears much more about the head is claiming it was a touch and the opposition is saying it was nowhere near okay right uh would the end have to be replayed or are there any other options okay so you've got a bit of a dispute going on in a pairs match about whether a bowl is a touch or not that's a really tricky one um you know it's one one word against another um I think often the, the default position really is that it's not a toucher, but you, you've, you've got to try and sort those things out amicably to get on with the game. Um, you know, it's, it's no good. Um, it's no good fighting over it. Um, but, but clearly, um, if one player thinks they've seen a toucher and another player thinks they haven't seen a toucher, then you've got to come to some sort of agreement. There's not really anything in the laws to, to cover that sort of disagreement, it's either a touch or it isn't. So you really have to um, work together to get that um, uh, sorted out. So thanks for those two questions, Hugh. 
Uh, is it an umpire's role to check the validity of the shoes a player is wearing? Um, it can be, yes. Um, if um, uh, and in the, the situation I described with um, uh, Canada is, is the prime example where they've got um, a whole range of um, pictorial examples of what's acceptable at some of the tournaments and what's not. It is the umpire's duty to do that. Um, now, I, I'm not aware of shoes being checked in the UK. Um, they may, may, may well have been. Um, there's certainly nothing in any competition rules that I'm aware of um, uh, about shoes checked, um, but it would fall to the officials to do that if um, if it's in a condition of play. Just going back to Hugh's um, question, I just wanted to um, highlight some of the questions that popped up on on some of these uh, Facebook pages recently about um, displacement and some uh, quite complex situations. Um, there was one that caused a bit of a debate on a, a question of Bowles um, site. And um, they are quite complex situations and they're, they're things that officials <laughs> always struggle to learn because um, there's, there's six pages of law on, on um, discipline. Um, so I just wanted to um, show you um, something that Certainly within England, we developed um, as, um, and I, I'll try not to get this one upside down there, um, something we've developed in England um, called displacement charts. And these are the actual sizes of them. Um, they're, they're quite small, they're, they're, they're sort of postcard size um, to fit the pocket um, when you're officiating. Um, the reason they were devised is because um, the complexity of going through the law book. Um, but I've, I've sort of blown one up for you here to see the sort of structure of it um, and it, it's really to help you ask the right questions on the rink when you're faced with a displacement situation um, and you, you, you simply just follow the, the, the arrows based on answers to the questions that you're given by the players um, and then hopefully at the bottom you'll see the, the law that applies um, in, in those situations so um, these are quite useful um, and so with some of the questions that have been posed on um, recently, I've, I've used those charts to, to, to guide my way through um, to understand the question. And that's the key part when you walk on the rink is trying to understand what the players have, um, are actually asking. Um, so displacement are tricky. Um, we all recognise that. Uh, and I would, I would defy any of you to remember the, um, the displacement laws that are in the book. Okay. Uh, Charlotte, yep, yeah, uh, done the shoes. Um, okay, um, anything else you want to learn about? Um, there was a question um, that popped in a while back about ditches and holding services from uh, Jim Byron. I don't know if you're online, Jim. Uh, welcome if you are. Um, Jim's question was, um, Law 47 says the ditch must have a holding surface which is free from obstacles and made of a material which will not damage the jack or the bolts. Many clubs that host national county tyres, however, have pebbles and stones in their ditches which damage bolts. Um, from his experience, umpires turn a blind eye to this law. What should can I do in such situations? Interesting question because um, I don't think we really turn I die to it it's more of the case of what do we actually do about it um if you're faced with a um, a green that's got a ditch full of pebbles um and you turn up to officiate a match what is there you can do about it um i tend not to carry a shovel in the back of my car um but you know you're not going to be you're not going to be altering the ditches um too much in that way so the most appropriate course of action for that is if you feel that the ditches don't comply with the laws um then you can report it to the controlling body um, of that competition. Now, quite often, um, that controlling body is actually a club, um, and you're, you, it's, it's a conversation. That you're, you're really just saying, Look, we don't feel comfortable with these ditches. They, they, they are damaging to bowls potentially. Um, you know, would you consider changing them for future years and future tournaments? Clearly, we recognise that there's a huge cost implication in doing that. Um, very similar thing to wide, wide ditches, um, deep ditches, you know, all of those things. Again, you know, we don't carry bags of sand to fill the ditches up um, to the right level. Um, 
and you know we have been to national indoor championships where uh, the ditches are too deep for a reason so there's very little we can do jim and not the fact that we're turning a blind eye to it uh, it's it's just there's very little that that we we can actually do on the day um and it's really just reporting those um the thing the other thing that is damaging um if you see wooden um banks um where the, the the wood is actually screwed on um some of the screws can sit proud and that can take a chip out of the bowl so looking for those sort of things when you're doing your green checks um at the beginning, uh, before the start of the game um is important um and, and you can you can just report them all some of those things you might be able to deal with a good hand. um so you, you might be able to do some of them but you know, certainly um ditch straight is very difficult to to uh, control so thanks for that question dale uh how would i attract more of the people to the game great question i think it's, it's a question that's asked across the bowls world you know how do we attract any age group to to the sport um uh, i think as uh, as we talked about earlier image is is so key um what you're wearing and the approach um uh, of uh, people when we get to the club um encourage people and family i think like most um most players um i i came through the the sport through family um, and that's the route that um, most people come um and i was 14 when i first started so you know, i was i was um young for those days not now uh, not that i'm old now but I will, uh, 14 isn't an old age nowadays and um, so um it's it's really about the image it's really about being um open and, and encouraging people to come into clubs getting away from that stuff of um of environment sometimes and 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 just just being out there encouraging people to join it's 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 a, it's a big challenge and you know most of the governing body has got some sort of program going on um to encourage people to to take up the sport um which which is great and you know, that's what it needs so that's a really good question thank you josh uh what's the longest time you've ever seen a player to take the side watch hard to play <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah some of them are. um and i think that goes back to what we were discussing earlier about time games and how important they are to keep keep things flowing um but there are some players out there um i'm not the names clearly um but there, there are people that like their time naturally they've got slow deliveries um which exacerbates the situation if they then have a conference in the middle of the ring um if i give an example of a, a match um or a, a series of matches that i was officiating in last year um where it was a fixed number of um, ends um over sets play and one ring finished almost by one end almost a set behind everybody else um so you know time games don't always um answer the question um but you you can get some some slow ones out there so thank you for that josh um <laughs> okay um barry i can't see barry's comment let me just clear some of those Barry says, is the reason that you are a bowls umpire because you are not a quick enough runner to be a football referee? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, <laughs> the, the reason I'm an um, uh, <laughs> the reason I'm an umpire um, is because I'm a rubbish player, and Barry knows that. Um, no, I, I started officiating because um, I was start. Uh, you know, I had general interest in in officiating and, and marking, and that's how I started. Um, and eventually I was getting to the point where I was actually officiating higher um, quality games than I could ever imagine playing, in, uh, such as national. Um, so that's the route I went. Um, football, hate it. Um, no interest in football whatsoever. I like a bit of rugby now and again. Um, one interesting thing that come out comes out of other sports is um, how um, their top officials um, deal with games and, and manage their... Um, officiating um and around about 2002 2003 around about the manchester to um, the commonwealth games period 
um, I managed to catch a, a, um, the autobiography of um, Pierre Luigi Colina, who was, I'm sure some of you, know, who was one of the top footballers um, in the world at the time, um, an Italian, big bulging eyes, bald head. Um, but I read his autobiography, and um, it was fascinating. No interest in football whatsoever, but I found his autobiography biography fascinating because of the way he wrote about his approach to officiating. Um, and I learned a lot from that. And then subsequently, in recent years, um, I've read um, Nigel Owens, the football, uh, sorry, the rugby referees um, autobiography as well, and very, very, very similar experiences. Um, so I think it, I think you can take um, lessons from some of the approaches that top officials in other sports have. Um, and of course, one of the beauties of, of um, being part of the Commonwealth Games is that you're involved in multi in a multi-sport um, event um, so you do get to meet other technical officials from other sports and it's great just to sit around and um, have a chat with them and um, what their experiences are in all kinds of sport so it's not because i can't run well i can't run but it's uh, because i don't like football you are dropping the middle <laughs> Uh, Joshua, are there any other times a player who wins and then won't start the next other than the Jacks play on delivery by a teammate? Interesting question, Josh. Um, some of you, may, you probably won't have seen it if you're not following um, uh, the, the Facebook page, um, a question of polls. Um, but it was an interesting question um, about um, misdelivery of a Jack um, at the start of an end. Um, essentially, I'm sure you're all aware that you can deliver a jack, or both players can deliver a jack incorrectly, um, i.e. less than 23 metres, or it goes in the ditch, or goes off the side boundary. Um, and if, if both players do that, um, then the jack gets on the two metre mark. Um, and and the play reverts to your position. Um, there are the odd occasion where, um, say for example, I delivered a jack and it went in the ditch, it comes back and Josh as my opponent would then reset the mat and deliver the jack again. If that jack hits um, somebody, neutral person, or hits um, a member of his own team, it comes back to me again for delivery. It doesn't go on to me to mark. Um, and this is a it's quite a complicated scenario. So um, apologies if you don't pick it up straight away. Um, but it comes back to me to deliver um, but actually, it's the opposition that, that does it. And that you, you basically end up with the uh, wrong player starting the end um, with the first bowl. Um, in answer to your question, Josh, um, we've, I actually went back um, to colleagues of mine on the Laws Committee um, to look at what options there were to revive that. Um, we've decided not to do anything about it because um, the... Um, the likelihood of occurrence is such that it really doesn't matter if the wrong person starts the end. Wrong as in they didn't win the previous end. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of not dealing with it. But there, there were two, two, um, two scenarios where that um, can occur. Um, so thanks for that question. I know we had a little bit of discussion online about it. Um, uh, and it's quite an interesting scenario, which, you know, and these, these sort of things are, are great for making us think about, as Let's let's get some different opinions on, on as well. So that was fantastic. Thanks, George. Charlotte, what's the Facebook page you keep mentioning, please? I think we're on it. Um, it's called a question of bowls. Um, I think Stephen is here. Um, there he is. Um, question of bowls. He's posted there for you. So um, yeah, take a look at that. It's quite some interesting discussion on there. Uh, Dale. Um, do you think all players should play with the same bias bowls to get an even more level playing field? <laughs> yeah, interesting. I, I think if you if you compared it to other sports, um, I think we're probably the only sport that really allows um, the equipment that's being used to be defined by the the, the player. Um, so, yes, there's an argument for it, but I think there's a bigger argument against it. I, I think everybody are everybody has their own um uh preferences to size shape model um and i i don't think it would be 
um, particularly wise to to try and standardize everything um, certainly certainly there's a standard um, but I, I think you know within those parameters I think um, uh, we, we need to we need to allow a little bit of flexibility um, in terms of bias you know if you're, if you're from the southern hemisphere for example where the, the, the rinks are a lot quicker and um, then you will be using a type bowl but they would still be compliant with the the world standard reference bowl um, and similarly um, in the northern hemisphere slightly slower greens you might want a bit more of a swingy bowl um, if you, you if you're playing skip for example you might want a more swing bowl than um than a lead but you know it's it's individual preference and i don't think personally i don't think um there should be a need to standardize outside the limits that we already have okay mark cowan my buddy from australia welcome mark um you're either up very early or you can't sleep um my thoughts on marking has changed over recent years uh, not markers are still of the opinion that they can only answer the question asked instead of stating the head yeah um uh great to see you my mark um so the approach to marking um, has changed over years. Um, a marker standing at the head, um, not really doing much apart from marking the scorecard, um, is not a lot of use to a player. Um, and I personally don't think it flows the game, it helps the flow of the game particularly well. So I would always encourage markers to be proactive and, and, and working with the players, um, give them the information they, they, they are looking for. Um, in terms of answering questions, there always used to be um, this um, perception that you should, well, it's not a perception, it's written in the laws, actually, but there, there always used to be this perception that um, you only answer the specific question asked. Um, but you can get into a dialogue. There are scenarios um, where you can get into that dialogue um, with the players um, and actually give them the wrong information at the end of the day. So, you know, if somebody asks you if they're one down and they're actually two down, then tell them they're two down. Um, you, the worst case scenario is um, they they could choose a shot that um, probably isn't appropriate to the answer. Um, so um, I think being proactive as a marker and uh, give the, the answer to the questions that they're looking for. And at the end of the day, if you if you're all familiar with marking and you stood up the end and the player says, "What's the position?" Would you do ignore it um, because it's not specific? Um, so yeah. I think the approach now is to is to be more proactive, and, and certainly with the televised games um, across the world now with televised games, um, you'll you'll hear markers um, calling, show indicating with lollipops, um, and you know the player may not even ask the question, um, but it's there for the, the benefit of. The and at the end of the day, it's to the marker's opinion as well. So thanks, Mark, for that, and I hope you're keeping safe and well down under. Uh, David, hi, Dave Bolt, welcome. Apologies, you've already asked, but thoughts on the new laser measure? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried the laser measures. Um, I'm not a great fan of them. Um, I personally find them cumbersome. Um, and actually, Mark's online from, from Australia. Um, interesting um, uh, viewpoint from uh, down under is that they're becoming more popular. Um, there, there are very proficient officials that can use them very quickly. Um, but certainly our experiences um, up here are, are that they are cumbersome um, to use. They are um, slower. Um, they've only got a limited use. Um, but you know, the, the age-old question is why can't we move into the 21st century and use something a bit more modern and a bit of string? Um, yeah, I can see that. But actually, um, a bit string is still very accurate in the right hands. Um, and, you know, the other, the other problem with laser measures, of course, is, is the cost. Um, so I'm not a great fan, but, you know, they have their place. And I don't think we'll see them at world level at any day soon. Um, but certainly domestic stuff, you may well come across them. So thanks, David. Um, hope you're well. Um, and if for, for all you listening, um, if you're interested in podcasts and um, uh, 
chats with bowlers and uh, officials and um, interesting people, then uh, try and catch up with David Bolt's um, podcast. Really, really good um, uh, discussions going on uh, with David Bolt. So look, look that one up. You'll have to remind that David. You'll have to remind everybody of the Facebook page it's on because I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, here. What do you think about doing away with the delivery of the jack to make it quicker as they do in a BPL? Where the jack is simply placed on one of the three mark spots on the green? Great question. Um, so, sorry, dry. Um, I think that has its place in, in some tournaments, such as the BPL. Um, I, I really do think that does um, help to, to speed things up, but it also gives a uh, a tactical approach to the game um so yeah I, I think that's a that's one of many um really good tournaments that we can we can look at uh, for certain tournaments adam adam point and welcome have i had any difficult players to deal with <laughs> yeah you get the odd one um yes i i think um certainly in the early days of officiating um trying to earn Certainly as a youngster, um, I was 20 when I first started. I was probably the youngest in the country at the time, um, trying to earn the respect of the players. Um, as a neutral is, is very difficult sometimes. Um, and you do get the odd occasion where um, you, you get questioned about a decision. Um, so it, it, it can happen. Difficult players, um, on the in terms of being on the rink with a player that's... Um, a challenge to mark for, for example, there are some. There are some difficult players to mark for. Um, I wouldn't call them difficult players, but they they are difficult to mark for to to really understand their game and and to get to know their questioning and and to um, to really um, do a good job. Of um, there are there are some out there, um, and it does make sometimes it makes you feel uncomfortable on the ring, but you know, generally you just have to go on with your job. Um, but generally speaking, I've not really had any massively difficult situations that um, can't be dealt with um, amicably, thankfully. Uh, question. Charlotte, Charlotte, as an umpire, have you ever made an error whilst umpiring? If so, what was it? I wouldn't admit to that. <laughs> yes, I'm sure I have. There are things when you walk off the ring you think yeah i could have done that a lot better um whether it's a mistake or not um really depends on on the situation in the game um i have been involved in um mistakes that have been made by officials uh, markers when i've been officiating of taking a bit of diplomacy to try and resolve um but i don't think i've really made um a massive glaring um whilst i'm pouring the one um situation that um uh, really did affect greatly in terms of whether I should carry on officiating or not was um, calling a game too early um, with WBT. Um, and that was a very difficult situation to deal with personally, um, but also I, I really felt for the players. Uh, that was a genuine mistake. Um, it was a lack of concentration, basically. Um, but I, I didn't take it well. I, I didn't handle that one well, so that was a very difficult situation. Um John Roberts, welcome. Hey, how you doing? Um, hope you're keeping well and safe. Um, good to hear from you. Uh, Josh, Jack gets hit and is going out of bounds. It goes just outside the line before coming to rest. The wind, <laughs> the wind picks up and blows it onto the line, so it's still alive. Is the Jack dead or is it still alive? Well, it's dead. Um, if the Jack passes over the boundary line, so if, it, if the law says if it passes over, not comes to rest. Um, over the boundary line. So as soon as he's passed that boundary line, um, it's dead. Um, no matter what the horses um, cause it to come back on. And actually the most common scenario where that can happen is, is when a jack um, goes at an angle um, towards the, the boundary line and goes in the ditch. And if, if there's rubber in the ditch or a substrate that allows it to bounce, um, sometimes the spin and bounce back in. Um, but it's past the boundary, it's dead. Uh, John, make a comment about Marcus talking to players in conversation. 
Um, I guess you mean when uh, the players are up at the head and you're having a conversation with them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't encourage it. Uh, generally, the, the, the advice to markers is um, to really only get to them if you're so, uh, don't make small talk with them. Um, they're concentrating on their game. You should be concentrating on your role as well. well um, so we certainly wouldn't encourage markers to actively engage in conversation. But it can happen. You know, you, you get into a chat with a player. Um, but the key thing is that, you know, you, you respect their, their play and their um, uh, their thought processes. And, and you've got to concentrate on what you're doing out on the rink as well. So that's important. We've all made errors. Yes, John. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we're only human. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, just um, uh, there are a few questions coming back in now. Um, I'm just going to um, talk to you a little bit about bowls. We, we talked about bias of, of bowls, and um, uh, one of the most common questions we get um, is what the requirements of bowls and how that works. Um, and we talked about bias um, and whether they can apply to the world, um, world reference bowl. Um, and so I, I just thought I'd show you, and it's not a very clear bowl because they're mine, but I thought I'd show you the, um, the requirements of a bowl when they're being inspected um, by an umpire at the beginning of the game. Let me centre it on the screen. Um, and there's a number of things that we're going to be looking for here. Um, uh, the first one is um, uh, here we go. the first one is this number here, which is a, a, a serial number. Um, so a set of bowls will have the same serial number, and that's that's the key thing to look for when um, checking bowls to make sure that you've got a set. Um, and it does happen. You get two bowls that look the same, but they've got the serial numbers, so that can happen as well. This one's the, the important bit um, in terms of stamping. Um, and you can see this has got a 20. Um, so uh, this, this bowl will expire this year in terms of stamping requirements um, for international play. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more, more about individual country requirements in a minute. Um, the the X that you can see there is the manufacturer code. Uh, and you've got an R and oops, sorry, went where uh, R in a circle. Uh, this side that's just a registered trademark, um, and obviously the WB means World Bowls there. Um, so this this stamp and and the the serial number there are the things we're looking for. Now in terms of stamping requirements, um, it does vary um, by country. Um, and and individual governing bodies um, are entitled to set their own um, uh, domestic regulations for stamping requirements. Uh, for example, in England, for domestic play, um, a bowl must have a, a date stamp of 1985 or later. Um, if you then get into a national, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, an international situation, then there's got to be a, a, a current um, World Bowl stamp. Um, so the, the most common place to find that regulation is in um, either the back of um, your individual country's law book um, in the display or tournament um, conditions um, or on their websites. Um, generally, we would um, be picking up bowls um, that will be coming out of date. So mine will need redoing before um, next year if I was ever lucky enough playing in anything more than a local competition, which is very unlikely. I hope that helps with stamping. Uh, Josh, uh, this bowl breaks. They can't replace it from the same set. And there are no other sets available. Does the player lose by default? Um, well, if you, if, you have no bowl, if you have no bowls and you can't replace them, um, then yes, you, you're, you're going to do that game, um, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty unusual to be in a club where there are no sets of bowls, even if there are a set of old lignums that are stuck in the attic. Um, so yeah, do all you can get a set of bowls um, if, if you do happen to break or damage one, um, so it's not usable. Okay. How are we doing for time? So we've been about an hour now. Um, and I hope um, that was useful for everyone. Um, what I'm just going to do uh, before we wrap up, um, I'm just going to pop a quick poll online for you just to um, 
answer at your leisure. Just whether you found this useful, um, a useful little session. Um, it's a bit ad hoc, but you know, it's, it's live. So, you know, it's just whether you, you feel this was useful um, and whether you think um, it will be a good idea to, to host another one um, at some point whilst we're in this period of lockdown or even when we open up on the rinks um, and get out there and play. Um, I'd be more than happy to host another one if you, you feel that that would be helpful to everybody to air their uh, questions. Um, last couple of questions then. Uh, your opponent maliciously breaks your bowl, no others left, do I still? <laughs> uh, yes, probably you would. Um, I think maliciously, um, I think there'll be other questions to be answered there if somebody's uh, maliciously, maliciously breaking your bowl, um, aside from losing the game by default. You know, they're, they're, they're tricky situations that wouldn't be covered by the laws because you, you've, you've got to deal with the um, the actual act of damaging the bowl. And if it's a mistake, then that's that's obviously not acceptable. Um, so, hi, Sue. Welcome again from Australia. There's a lot of people waking up now in Australia, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Great session. Thank you. Uh, Paul Ferris, the jump bounce is back. Off the bank board is it live um yes if um the degree bounds for face of the bank and it's important to define the face of the bank is um if it if it bounces off the face of the bank then um and comes back into the the boundaries of the rink then it is uh, live so thank you for that charlie thank you it's bernie Okay. Well, if you're all happy with um, with that session and and you've answered all your questions and have, have learned something from it, then let's let's call it a day for this afternoon, and um, maybe we can catch up again another time. Uh, hopefully, we we'll back out on the bowling greens um, soon. Um, so, I wish you well. Um, the the main thing really for everybody is to keep safe um, this horrible situation we find ourselves in. So, you know, please do keep safe, keep well, um, and, you know, bear with it. Um, it's a tough period. We will get out on the morning again and we will start um, enjoying our, our bowls and officiating at some point. So thank you everybody for joining me this afternoon. Hope it's been useful and, and maybe see you again soon.